Well, good morning. Uh, I'm glad everybody made it back today. Um, the uh, we we talked around the scapula on several issues yesterday, and so hopefully we can put it all together in a way that will make a little bit more sense uh, to everyone today. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about the scapula in the context of what I called the disabled throwing shoulder yesterday. Um, this has um, also relevance for um, workers and other people as well. Uh, I'll, I'll, if, you, if you all get nothing more out of today, I would like for you to uh, remember this picture right here. This represents the arm, shoulder joint, scapula, and the clavicle. And remember that the arm is connected to the body very, very um, uh, poorly from a stability standpoint, but very well from a mobility standpoint. And you have to understand this whole triangular complex to understand how the arm works. And so you have anterior stability of the clavicle to the SC joint, as was mentioned yesterday about how important the SC joint is. Powell did a great job on that. Remember, posteriorly, to allow the mobility and the positioning and all these different positions of the scapula, it's all muscle. And therefore, you have to have good muscles. They have to be well balanced. They have to be attached the way they should be. And this allows this triangular pivot, which allows this arm stability, at the same time, mobility. So the normal motions of the scapula uh, have been defined in on classical biomechanical uh, methods of having uh, translations, which are sliding along the thoracic wall, upward, downward, medial, and lateral. This is the scapula. All of the members of the scapula society, uh, Ann Cools and I are members of the scapula society. This is the scapula. It goes up and down and medial to lateral. When the clavicle strut is intact, when you have AC separation, as was mentioned yesterday, then you lose that strut and you get the th what's called the third translation, which is down and in and under. There are motions, which are rotations around a, a point. You have upward and downward rotation. This is the one we usually talk about in raising the arm. This is the classical two to one uh, humerothoracic, uh, humeroscapular rotation. But also you get anterior posterior tilt and internal external rotation around axes as well. And the most effective position for scapular and therefore arm function is to have the arm, have the scapula in a position of relative retraction, which is an external rotation, posterior tilt, and medial rotation, medial translation. Now this is, uh, this is some of our um, work that we did uh, with uh, motion monitor and biomechanics um, studies, and this, this shows the motion of the scapula as the arm moves. And uh, as the arm moves, it'll move four times, and as it moves, you can watch one of these three, each of these three here represents one of the axes of motion, as I mentioned. Watch it th the three times. The fourth time, I want you to see what, the, what happens to the acromion and what happens to the glenoid as a result of this motion. So the first time, watch the red. This is upward rotation. It goes up. That's what you expect. The green is anterior-posterior tilt. Watch how it tilts posteriorly. And look at the blue, which is internal-external rotation. It goes internal, then it goes to external rotation. And then the fourth. Okay, now where does the acromion go? It goes up. What else does it do? goes back. That's the reason that you, the re reason the scapula is important in impingement. And I'll show you some, I'll show you a, a video of an injured patient in a minute, but she goes back. The other thing, look where the glenoid is. It's pretty close to horizontal. So it is a very stable base to allow arm rotation. Now you imagine muscle activations that create this, but this is what, this is the normal pattern of scapular motion as you move your arm. Now this is Sparky the sea lion in the Minneapolis Zoo in in United States. He's going to illustrate the dynamic nature of glenohumeral stability. There's your humerus. 
there's your scapula, and there's your glenoid. Now, how's, that, how's the ball going to stay on the sea lion's nose? The sea lion has to move. So in other words, if you want glenohumeral stability, you have to have good motion of the scapula in relationship to the moving arm. So that's, that's the key point. The normal mechanics in the overhead thrower in the athlete, the most effective position is control of protraction. You want retraction, and then as you come out of retraction, you want to control protraction in a controlled manner. You want to maintain external rotation of the scapula as long as you can. That allows you to have this maximum concavity compression or stability, and that is the key point for effective throwing. You want the, you know, the glenohumeral angle to be pretty close to straight. You don't want it if you go too far anterior posterior. turns out that plus or minus 30 degrees in axial view, and you get instability because what you'll get is the muscle forces and the joint forces outside the center. So if you do, if you do this right, you get max, maximal biomechanical concavity compression of the humerus into the glenoid, which gives you the maximum glenohumeral stability, minimum ligament tension, and straight line muscle pull, which is what they do best. Dr. Job showed this many years ago. You want the direct, you want the force directed toward the center of the circle, and that, that only occurs when this is lined up well, which means the scapula has to move uh, in relationship to the humerus. We usually talk about the humerus, anterior instability, and all kind of stuff. But you remember you got to worry about that glenoid as well. Now, scapular dyskinesis is the term used when that motion is altered. Dis meaning alteration of, kinesis meaning motion. It's very commonly seen in almost every type of uh, shoulder injury, anywhere up to 100%. It's basically, we, we did a, a consensus conference, and the con results of that consensus conference was put out in the September 2013 issue of British Journal of Sports, uh, Sports Medicine. And when we were wrestling with this, we realized that this is not a diagnosis. It's not a, it doesn't, it's not a cause and effect, but this dyskinesis is an impairment of optimum function. And if you keep on doing it long enough, you can get injury, but it's not necessarily, but it's, a, it's an impairment of this normal scapular humor rhythm. And the consensus was when it's found associated with symptoms, it should be addressed as part of the comprehensive treatment. This is an alteration in both static position and dynamic motion. It's both, probably I think dynamic motion is most important. There are multiple causative factors and you have to be smart enough to figure out what they are. And the result is that they get anterior tilt, internal rotation, and lack of upward rotation. So if the ones here is your scapula, you go anterior tilt, internal rotation, and you don't get much upward rotation. So it's a protracted scapula. It's clinically, it's an observational thing. You can see it. If you see this part right here, what does that tell you about the position, the posture of the scapula? What is it doing? Anteriorly tilted, internally rotated. It's a clinical observation. It turns out that actually you can do this pretty well, and it's uh, clinically useful, and it, it correlates pretty well with the actual biomechanical motions. It's an altered uh, position, you, and you use the medial border of the scapula as your landmark, and this is what we usually call protraction. Okay, this is a video of an injured patient looking from behind. Uh, which side is injured? Now I've got a 50% chance of being right. Which side is injured here? Okay, how many say left? Nobody gonna raise your hand, eh? How many say right? Okay, let's watch it. What, look, look at the posture of the thorax. That ought to tell you something right there. Okay, so you watch elevation. You see, how are they getting elevation of that right side? They're moving the thorax. Why are they moving the thorax? Because the scapula is not upwardly rotating or posteriorly tilting. Okay, now if you think that's a little hard to see, let's go here. This is looking at it from the top. Same, same patient. I think you can see right there the uh, difference of the posterior tilt of the left scapula versus there's no posterior tilt of the right scapula, so it's not going back. What, is, what does that have, what's that mean about the acromion? Where's the acromion? Sitting down, and therefore you cannot raise your arm. 
and there's no rotate there's no external rotation it stays in a position of relative internal rotation so there's the impairment of the motion and position that creates the symptoms and you can see this on your patient and I'll show you this I'll show you that patient with skin and bones on here in just a second okay what are the effects on shoulder mechanics in the throwing athlete Dr. Yu did a very, very interesting study where he did 3D CT and did some computer modeling and he, of the glenohumeral joint in the throwing motion, and then he computer modeled five to, only five degrees of excessive anterior tilt of the scapula. And what he found, just five degrees of anterior tilt of the scapula in relationship to the arm, he modeled the labrum around the humerus there's the biceps there's the labrum and he modeled the rotator cuff attaching he found that with this five degrees of anterior tilt he changed the compressive forces on the labrum look where the look where the compressive forces are right where we talked about yesterday right there at that 10 o'clock to 12 on the glenoid and these forces are about Times higher than what they would be uh, in normal and the compressive forces on the rotator cuff once again right at that same level are about four times normal so five degrees of anterior tilt creates large compressive forces as the arm goes into abduction external rotation dr. Uh, Mihata has done several very interesting uh, pieces of work and he looked at the scapula, and he looked at the normal orientation for upward rotation, internal rotation, anterior tilt, and he then changed these positions and looked at the uh, amount of internal impingement. He changed it to m more upward rotation and less upward rotation, and more internal rotation and less internal rotation. And then unfortunately, he just did less anterior tilt. He didn't do any posterior tilt. And what he found out of these, and then he measured the contact pressures, and he found out that decreased upward rotation increases the area of internal impingement, that area of the rotator cuff that's actually being impinged. And then increased internal rotation increases the area and the pressure. So once again, internal rotation creates increased pressure just like the five degrees of anterior tilt. So you see all this combination of this protraction, anterior tilt, loss of upward rotation, and internal rotation create extra load on the structures inside the joint. What's that got to do with anything? Well this is a study we did when we looked at throwing athletes with labral tears and instability and you see once again that in compared to the non-injured group the injured group has less external rotation has more internal rotation at the ranges of motion above 90 degrees where this is important they also had less upward rotation so this fits, so these patients that we see with these injuries have exactly the extra compressive forces that were modeled in the, um, in, in the uh, studies. Therefore, it, uh, it means we, we've got a lot of, we've got to pay attention to this. And therefore, how do you do an exam that suggests some of these things? And the idea is that you've got to establish the presence and absence of this dyskinesis. And it is a visual at this point in time. And then you have what's called corrective maneuvers. What you do is you look at the medial board of the scapula. And you watch the motion as you take the arm at three to five repetitions in forward flexion. Have three to five pound weights in their hand. We once thought that we could break this down into these patterns, type 1, type 2, type 3. turns out that that's not very sensitive or specific, but if you say yes, no, dichotomous, it, you either see medial border prominence or you don't, and then that turns out to be very, very uh, accurate. And so if you do the yes, no pattern, you have 0.84 specific specificity, and it's a 0.87 relationship to, we did motion monitor and showed that the biomechanics of the, of the shoulder, of the scapula is off. So it's, it's a very good, if you see it, it exists. And specificity is 0.64, sensitivity 0.82, positive predictive value 0.84. And this was in the literature, arthroscopy 2009. The corrective maneuvers then do something to manually change the scapula position and motion. 
We have two called the scapular assistance test and scapular uh, uh, retraction test. Scapular assistance test basically assists the scapula in upward rotation as the arm goes into overhead. If you have a painful arc or an impingement, as was mentioned yesterday, this is one way to find out whether the scapula is playing a role or not. You do this and you find the symptoms are, are diminished. That tells the patient that whatever you did to them, they can't see what you're doing back there, whatever you did to them changes their symptoms and therefore they, first of all, they think you know what you're talking about. And second is that whatever, they, whatever you did, if I could do that too, then my symptoms will go away. So they're going to be more adherent in the therapy program. Scapular retraction test is manual stabilization of the scapula in this retracted position. And there are two positives there. One is that you actually can show that the muscle strength, rotator cuff strength, is actually normal. And then in the DLS test that I showed you yesterday, if you put the, the scapula in a retracted position so you retro-tilt the glenoid, you find that you reduce the internal impingement so that that test is uh, not positive. Okay, here's an individual. This is the... This is the skin on the bones of that um, video you saw before. So which shoulder is injured and why? You should get this one right now, okay? Okay, there's, there's your marker. Right there, there's your marker. If you see that, where is the rest of the scapula? Anteriorly tilted. Okay, but this, to see the inferior medial border, you got to have anterior tilt. Now, you therapists, you tell me, okay, well, how does that occur? I'm not even going to ask the doctors because I know you all don't know, but your therapist ought to know, why is it tilted that way? Well, what's that? Tight pec, tech, tight pec minor. It's always tight. Okay, what else? Weak lower trapezius. Okay, what's, what's, what's attached to the most inferior border there? No, not a little lat, but not much. This is a muscle you all don't even think of. Serratus. Serratus. You say, oh, serratus is a protractor. No, serratus is a retractor when you get your arm up there. And the serratus is not working. Low trap and serratus is not working. Pec minor is too tight. Lat's tight a lot of times in these patients, too. So let's see what happens with this guy. Oh, the reason he's here is because he has a painful arc. He has impingement. He's a baseball pitcher. He has impingement, and he was had an injection. We didn't talk about injections yesterday. You know, I don't like them much. But he had an injection, and didn't work. And so he was sent to me to do a subacromial decompression. Okay, that's why he's in my office. So you see his medial border. You watch him elevate his arm. Okay, see, as an eccentric load occurs, what happens? His muscles quit. Uh, right about in this area, we call it kick, off, kick out. Right about here, his low trap and his serratus, I mean, you do an EMG, they just shut off. So they're not working. So the weight of the gravity, weight of the arm, the pec pulling tight and the lat pulling tight is what's giving you that right there. See how this anterior, see how he doesn't get that, an, that posterior tilt at all and he's got that anterior tilt. Then if you evaluate him here, we test his strength. They're in manual muscle testing. Uh, it's weak and it hurts right there. Okay, so he's got impingement. He's got rotator cuff disease, right? That's what we heard yesterday. Now watch this. Stabilize the scapula. Hold his arm. Now he has normal strength. Normal strength and no pain, which shows that the rotator cuff itself is not part of this problem. It's a scapular dyskinesis that's a problem. Now this is internal rotation. He only has about five degrees inter ten, you know, of internal rotation compared to the opposite side. It's got, you know, but, so there's a, a deficiency of internal rotation of about 40 degrees, and here's the result of the scapula. You see what happens to get the same arm position when you have those tight posterior structures? You have no choice but to shrug and to, and because of all this tightness back through here. It's, it's capsule, but it's mainly muscle. Trying to throw a baseball in that position right there, you imagine how hard it'd be. So that's the reason he has impingement. You can do anything you want to the subacromial space. It's not going to change the fact that he has in, he has altered mechanics. And if you once again you put him back here, that's where he's supposed to be, and it's difficult because these muscles are weak. So dyskinesis in the symptomatic shoulder. Yeah, there's a clinically significant probability altered motions exist. Thank you very much.